what is up guys welcome to another video i hope you guys are all doing good it finally happened a mathematician and a chemist decided that they wanted to break down terence howard's theories so without further ado guys let's get straight into today's video and do not forget to like comment and share because it helps us out in the algorithm all right i'm joined with professor lee cronin who is a professor of chemistry. Finally! He's at the University of Glasgow and has a fellowship at the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Mm. For those who are unfamiliar, my name is Kurt J. Mungle and I have a background in mathematical physics and this is a podcast Perfect. dedicated to theoretical physics, namely theories of everything. Here today we're going to analyze Terence Howard. Mm. He had some comments on the Joe Rogan experience as he made plenty of chemistry, even some mathematical claims. And we want to point out where we think he's correct, where we're not sure, and where we don't understand, and where we think he may be conflating or misunderstanding. Imagine a world where one times one equals two, and where our very understanding of the universe is turned on its head. I'm talking about Terence Howard's appearance on the Joe Rogan experience, where he unveiled his mind-bending theories about the universe. Terence Howard, an actor turned scientist has developed what he calls teriology. This theory, influenced by the work of the enigmatic polymath Walter Russell, suggests that the universe operates in ways that defy conventional logic. Howard's claims are bold, stating that the sun births planets and that each planet births moons. Walter Russell, born in Boston in the late 19th century, was a true Renaissance man. He ventured into painting, sculpture, writing, and even philosophy, leaving behind a legacy filled with creativity and a quest for knowledge. His major works, like the Universal One, propose a universe driven by continuous creation and destruction, challenging mainstream scientific norms. Now, let's explore the heart of Howard's teriology. It aligns perfectly with the uniplanetary evolution theory. According to this theory, Mars is Earth in the future, devastated by a cataclysmic impact, while Venus was Earth in its past. This theory goes as far as to suggest that planets like Neptune and Mercury are just different temporal versions of Earth, all birthed from solar ejections of iron-rich plasma by the Sun. This year, we could witness a new Earth being ejected from the Sun during its total maximum solar flip, a spectacle of cosmic proportions if true. I'm looking forward to it, Kurt. Let's do it. Walter Russell and and um, and uh, Michael Hudak, you know, took me under his wing and started talking to me. But he was more into the philosophy and the love that Walter was talking about. But I, my, by the way, have you seen this before, Lee? I I watched some of it in preparation, and I watched the main part in preparation, and then the other stuff. I was like, "What's going on?" Okay. So yeah. Okay. So I'm we're getting pretty unfairly... much your unfiltered responses. I'm fairly prepared, yeah. Okay. It was to rebuild the periodic table, you know, build a new periodic table, because the stuff I had learned in, in college, you know, I went to ask, I told the teacher, um, the professor, about um, the relationship between hydrogen on the spectrometer and carbon and silicon and cobalt, and it was like it's the same exact color, same tone, just doubled in each op Okay, he's saying the hydrogen is, is the same tone as cobalt. What is meant by that? It's very difficult to interpret. I don't know whether he's meaning the same color or the same kind of frequency related with it. And But the thing is, there's only a fixed frequency in the electromagnetic spectrum where you see things, right? And and there are repetitions in the periodic table. So, you know, when you do flame tests, if you look at, say, sodium, you get this nice kind of orangey color. And if you have some, you know, look at, say, copper, you'll get some green color. And and so I was kind of confused. I mean, I love the kind of poetic kind of, you know, thoughts about these things. And it, it seems to me that he's making some allegorical um, a comparison at this stage, which I think is cool. Um, but I, but uh, as we can get into it, I, I think I can probably narrate you know what it, what is what is correct science today what are the actual knowledge we have about the elements because i think he you know there's poetry in chemistry and i love that but there is also discrete numbering in the periodic table and and that's a fascinating thing and that's well known and chemists uh, are taught this in chemistry 101 in fact i'm bashing it into my son at the moment he has a chemistry exam tomorrow uh -huh. but he's still he's still arguing with me about the 
definition of the element. Let's continue. And he was like, no, each element is the same element and it will always be that element. And I was like, you don't see the... Oh, just a moment, I'm going to replay. Um, the relationship between hydrogen on the spectrometer and carbon and silicon and cobalt, and I was like, it's the same exact color, same tone, just doubled in each octave. You'll see hydrogen sitting all the way over there by itself, but they don't show that hydrogen has the same tone as, as carbon. What do you mean by tone? Okay, so, so Joe is asking what he means by tone. I'm going to let him explain, and then please oh, you explain. Same tone, ki same key of E. Yeah. Same. same what? What did he say? Same key of E. Key of E. So I think he's talking about some energy relationship, right? K-E-V. Um, but it's kind of, yeah. I see. Okay. Like how there's GEVs. Physicists study, physicists use GEV. Okay. Yeah. So they have the same energy? That's what he's saying. And, and he's kind of mistaken. And I'll explain what okay. that is in a minute. 40.5 hertz. Kind the of... next one would be like um, 81 hertz. You go to silicon, it will double up and would be 162 hertz. You'll go to, to, to cobalt and it'll be 324 hertz. You keep dividing light by two and you'll ultimately get back to the audible sound of it because there was a relationship between light and color, sound and tone, matter and shape. I put... Uh, Okay, so it, there's a there's a lot to unpack here, and I think it might would be worth actually, like, um, explaining what the periodic table does and two really important things, and then we'll start to unpack this because um, this is very poetic, but it doesn't bear any relationship to chemistry in the periodic table in a in a in a in a concrete sense where we're looking at what the difference between the elements is. Of course, the elements can have different colors. You can, they, you can shine light on them and so on, and they can have what's called an absorption spectrum, and they can share commonalities. So what is an, what is an atom? So an atom, probably all your viewers know what an atom is. There are protons in all atoms. In, in virtually all other atoms except hydrogen, there are neutrons. When it comes to chemistry, that is a subject which I failed. I think it's super boring. So I'm trying to keep up. So bear with me. I'm just like very confused because there's certain things which I don't really understand. And I'm like, what? So it takes me a little bit back to school when my chemistry teacher was constantly just yapping about all of these elements and all of that. And I would, I don't know, I would zone out. So I'm kind of zoning out right now. And I'm like, no, don't zone out. Come back. So I'm like, okay, let me try to, let me really try to understand what he's saying. And then the proton has a charge, and then and the electron balances that charge. And so the periodic table is a count in what's called atomic number. So one, two, hydrogen, helium, three, mm -hmm. lithium, four, beryllium. And you can keep going up the periodic table, and that is the number of protons. Now, associated with each element, you have a number of protons, you have to have the balancing number of electrons. Now, the standard kind of model of chemistry is those electrons are quite small and they're they're described by quantum mechanics but they like quantum mechanics has discrete quanta the electrons occupy uh, energies at discrete quanta and the periodic table you have this top layer and then you have layers going down and they are basically tell you about the the number of layers that you have of electrons right that's a very simplistic way of looking at it now when you hit an atom with some lights the electrons get excited. So sure, you can. those electron excitements are a function of the, the how much you lift the electron up and you take the negative charge away from the positive charge and then it'll fall back down again. And there's a really nice spectroscopy called photoelectron spectroscopy where you rip an electron off an atom, it will then fall back down and give out light. And that's called the absorption spectrum. So if you look at, if you look at the sun, you can see the hydrogen lines. They're nice, straight lines, right? It's a really nice proof, if you like, or indication of quantum mechanics. Now, the elements, they they all have lots of different colors, and they can overlay, right? They can have the same color, but that doesn't mean they're the same thing and the same absorption. It just means the energies of the that electron to get out of the atom are similar. And so, so I think that... What he's doing is confusing a number of different things. Point of fact, elements are described by the periodic table, mm. and they are arranged in the conventional periodic table in order 
of of uh, atomic number. And the reason why you have this box is like you have hydrogen here and then helium, and then you can go all the way up, right? And you have these shells. So the first shell is that you have two electrons, and the second shell you have eight, and then it goes up and up and up as you go down. You could find many different ways of arranging the periodic table, but they don't make any chemical sense. And and it it all the elements in one kind of column have very similar properties. So you take sodium and lithium. If you were to take the metals of sodium and lithium, he talked about water, and you add them to water, they will basically react with the water. And that's why you can make lithium ion batteries with lithium. You can also make sodium ion batteries with sodium. They're not quite as good. And in biology, in so human technology uses lithium, right? It, from the periodic table for batteries, but in our cells, when for the mm -hmm. all the energy in the cell, we actually use sodium and potassium. Okay. And you can see the relationship going down. And so I love the poetry here, but I'm super confused about where the tones and the colors come from. I can only surmise that he, was, he loved the absorption spectra that you can see for some of these elements. But if you look in the sun with a spectrograph, you'll see hydrogen and helium and lithium, and they're clear lines. And if you do that on Earth with spectroscopy, you do the same thing. You will never mistake carbon for hydrogen. That's impossible. You might see under certain conditions that carbon might have an atomic absorption in a similar region to hydrogen, but that doesn't mean they're the same. The elements are fixed by the number of protons. The only thing you can do to change that one element into another is alchemy. Now, luckily, you can do alchemy in a nuclear reactor or in the sun. And so, I, you know, that's kind of my very short, mm -hmm. what is a periodic table? And you can arrange them and so on. And it was lovely poetry. But what kind of worried me a little bit was this kind of allegorical analysis. People were saying, you know, oh, there's we've, we've been told these lies. Mm. There you go. There's a hydrogen okay. emission spectrum about the periodic table. This is what he's referring to. That yeah. If you were to shine light on hydrogen, it would then emit light at four, well, these are four different wavelengths. So you shine light on, so the light like, pushes an electron out into like a zero kinetic energy, like away, like free, like in orbit around the Earth. And then okay, let me try to see if I understand it. <laughs> a dumb person trying to understand chemistry here. Uh, Terence is saying that everything is connected through, I guess, light and frequency. It's all connected. And it's the exact same thing as counting all the way up and counting all the way down. And it's if you hit a certain element in its frequency, I don't know if you can change it. I don't know about that, but everything is connected. So it's almost like a stair. Uh, and he is saying, no, there are two different properties. You have the elements over here, light over here, and I guess frequency over here. And they're not really interconnected as Terence claims. Um, so I get what he's saying. Um, he's a chemist, so I have to go with him on this. So scientific community one and Terence zero at the moment. Perhaps it's back down, it gives out a color, and that color is absolutely diagnostic of the electron in that condition. And and um, and so if you look at the atomic absorption, say, of carbon, you'll see a completely different um, spectrum. There you go. And so you can see that you've got carbon and oxygen and hydrogen. They're not the same, right? Car carbon uh, um, has many more lines. Why? It has many more electrons many more quantum numbers okay and so that's do you think he was saying that look if you were to space out carbon so just multiply by two so let's just say the distance between here this this purple one in the left side is one unit and then you times that by two so then and i love the fact that they're trying to understand him they're not just disregarding all that he's saying they're actually trying to understand the space would be two units and this one let's call it two units, so then the space would be four units, this one was... You understand that if you were to space them out, that it would equal somehow some other chemical? Is that what you think yeah, its claim I, is? I don't think so. I don't know. I must admit, I was incredibly confused 
Um, but at the same time, I thought, well, you know, he is trying to kind of understand the periodic table in a slightly different way. Mm. And I'm, and I'm, you know, I kind of thought some time today about it. I even talked to my research team about it because it's kind of an interesting example. Like he's just publicized the periodic table to millions of people. That's so cool. Good bit. Sad bit is kind of confused everybody <laughs> because of his uh, allegorical part. But that doesn't mean, you know, it's not bad. It's just not, it's not, you know, it's not correct to say that about the elements. That's not what they do. Yes. There is no mystery in the periodic table with respect to these numbers. We know they exist. We can measure them. That's where we've come very far. There's okay. lots of mystery about how do we get these elements to react. And one of the reasons I am an inorganic chemist, so organic chemists just focus on carbon. They're really like really dedicated to using carbon because they're for drug discovery and so on. Inorganic chemists have to deal with the whole periodic table. So there's all little tricks you use in the periodic table, like diagonal relationships and so on. But when he was talking about water and beryllium reacting, okay. I think he's misunderstanding electrochemical processes and using elements to provide energy to cause other things to happen. Of course, if you take hydrogen and you add some energy to it, you can split it into hydrogen and oxygen. In fact, anyone could do it by getting a, you know, getting a plastic cup putting some water in it, get two brass tacks, uh -huh. punch it in the bottom, get a nine volt battery and on top, and you'll see bubbles. And at one electrode, you'll have hydrogen coming out and one will be oxygen. And mm -hmm. that's because the water's being torn apart by the electric current. This is well-known chemistry. And so there was there were lots of layers. I would love to have talked to him about what he meant because it was like, you know, he was presumably talking about inspiration and the way he was interpreting the periodic table. But it wasn't clear to me why he felt it needed to be reinterpreted. I can actually answer that. The reason why is there has to be some form of a story when it comes to all of these things, I think, so we can try to understand what it is. For instance, I can take the Drake Kendrick Lamar beef, right? Uh, this TikToker, she's a teacher at a school. Apparently, this whole Drake and Kendrick beef happened and she was very surprised over the fact that the kids started reading the lyrics right and start breaking them down and trying to understand what kendrick means and what drake means and then they have this huge like presentation right but then it's forcing kids to read more to be more articulate so there's a lot that is happening there and i think with chemistry there is no flashiness there's no awe to chemistry it's just a really really like super boring and what Terence is very very good at is explaining things and adding that flashiness that wonder and that is the reason why i think a lot of people were so intrigued to his explanation because no one has ever explained it like that before no one has combined everything and uh, explained all of these elements with frequency and no one has ever done that. They've just said like, well, this is this boring thing and this is how it looks like. And as, as a student, it's very hard to take in information if it is boring. At, at least that's how my mind works nation he was going to give the world with it right yes you know mendeleev and all these guys thought about it for years the, pe the periodic table's been really good at predicting what happens next you know and there were elements missing in the periodic table went oh uh oh there's a gap here mm. i wonder if there's an element with this number of protons going to be found and then boom people found them and so they went around and found all the you know a lot of elements there's a lot of elements found in different mines and things around the uk and in the us and russia and france and so on so I was I was deeply confused, but at the same time fascinated mm. by the response. Yes. So for people just tuning in or just moving to this point, Terence is clearly bright. And just for so when I was going through his work, at one point he mentioned something like the free algebra generated by V or generated by X, quotiented by some two-sided ideal, something like that. Then you know enough, in my opinion, to be classified as bright, especially if you if you come to that understanding outside the university it also shows that you're super curious which i love and usually on the joe rogan podcast he has his mind blown that's the stereotype of the joe rogan podcast but on this one it seems like terence 
has his mind blown constantly. And and that's cool because it just means you have fervency over your the ideas that you've had for years. And some science some scientists can be dry about their own research, even blase. Terence isn't, and I love that. It, the difficult part for me is that it it then is him speaking like a fire hose, and you have to speak to ensure that your interlocutor understands, and you have to do so step by step, and then re-explain again and bring people you have to reference steps that came before and do so in a slow manner, not a deluge. And so, well, we can get to one times one equals two later, but let's continue with this. Um, yeah. I, I sent over yeah. Walter Russell's. I was trying to get to that. That's what... Yeah, mm. it's it's Walter Russell's periodic table that he put together. Now you compare that to what we... Men, 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 Oh, by the way, someone said a hilarious comment on the on the YouTube channel for him. They said Joe Rogan was on the Terrence Howard experience. <laughs> Layoff, I'm in the layoffs periodic table. You'll compare Walter Russell's to it, and you'll see something completely different. It's unwinding, and you see there's a relationship. But go back to the um, the Wiggly one. This is how I saw it more so, but as a vortex. But you'll see there's a relationship. Between hydrogen, carbon, silicon, cobalt, rhodium, they're all bonded. They're all. Si I'm very interested to find out if this chemist is going to think that this periodic table is better than the other one. Because personally, I think this one is better. But then again, I'm not a chemist, so. As a middle point between two noble gases. So what he's referencing is another formulation of the periodic table, which just when someone says periodic table, what they mean is some arrangement of atoms in some order that gives insight mm. and explains relationships. So you mentioned before conventional periodic table. So that to me means that are th that implies that there are multiple periodic tables. So is that the case? Do you, as a chemist, use only one periodic table? Do you use none of them and just focus on some other form of calculation? Are you not aware of this? No, I'm aware. So, I mean, the periodic table history is fascinating. It's a bit like, you know, the history of any technological era or any kind of understanding science, right? I think a good example is probably pre-Newtonian gravity, gravity, special and general relativity, right? Um, we use Newtonian physics still because it's still pretty good to get to the moon and stuff, and we can make adjustments that Einstein gave us. The periodic tables that he refers to aren't um, in any way, I can't, I, and I don't want to be rude or I don't want to be disparaging because it's cool. He's talking about they're not in any way in use today, right? There is no use of these periodic tables by chemists. A chemist would look at, use a periodic table to basically identify what's called a non metal and a metal and look at the different blocks. And we would teach that to students so they get to understand the periodic table, mm. the relationships. Because as you go down the periodic table, you get you get trends. And as you go across, you get trends. Mm -hmm. And what he's talking about, these midpoints, that's 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 just um I guess I could make I'd like make reference to um some kind of labeling schemes. Occasionally people like the maybe in category theory, like in some areas of mathematics. You might say, I'm going to make a new labeling scheme for this thing that helps me to give insight, right? You know, take maybe, say, St Stephen Wolfram using cellular automata to tell us something about physics, right? We might use those in some new way and say, hey, can we look at physical reality? And that that may or may not be a robust representation of some things. You can play with it. It's a toolbox. Here, um, there's no toolbox, right? It's not clear to me what these representations would do. The chemists like basically use the, the current periodic table to to understand where the valence electrons are, these electrons on the outside, and these electrons are responsible for all the chemistry mm. that you do, right? How you do the reactions and so on. And as you get deeper in, um, these electrons are less boring. Uh, uh, sorry, are more boring, mm. except for some very special heavy ones where the electrons in the cent in the middle actually pop out and are very sharp. And they're used for colors in, in phosphors. They're like europium and erbium. And okay, let's pause it there. We need a stupid man's break. Uh, let me try to explain it so I understand what he's saying. Um, he doesn't really understand 
how you would use that as a tool, right? Because the way that he views his periodic table, the boring one, is, well, it's like a screwdriver. You know exactly how it looks like, you know how to use it, you know where to put it. Uh, but Terrence Howard's uh, version, or the one which he uses, he doesn't really understand if it's a tool or if it isn't a tool and how they're connected. And that is a very good example to why they do not use that periodic table specifically. So he's 100% correct. And this is the audit which I was talking about. If it works and we're moving forward, great. If it doesn't work, we maybe should reanalyze the periodic table and use the one which works. But then again, this is a chemist. He works with it every day. They are developing so many medicines with this periodic table. So this is a valid argument to why we use the one which we have, the boring one, and not the whimsy, the fascinating one. Are uh, these, these rare earths, and they're really good at making shiny colors, and you can use them in some kind of medical imaging and cell imaging. They're super expensive. And so, so, no, so that's a very long answer. So there's only one periodic table that's in use today. The other periodic tables have no use other mm. than to explain how science kind of battled to try and figure out what was the ground truth. Mm. In the same way that when people were looking at electricity, is electricity a liquid? Is it, uh, you know, a solid? Mm -hmm. How do you out account for static electricity in a battery and a lightning and then AC? And they realized that electricity was unified by electromagnetism. In the same way, the unification of the periodic table is periodicity that comes from filling electrons in shells and going down quantum levels. So what I mean by that is at the top of the periodic table, we would have hydrogen and helium, one electron and two electrons. There is no more electrons you can have in the valence shell at the top. When you go down a level, then you go down to lithium and beryllium and across, right, to, you know, uh, the, the first row when you have I um, mean, the carbon is there and nitrogen is there and oxygen is there. You go down a level and you have eight electrons there, right? And then, and so you have this counting scheme and that counting scheme is critical for understanding bond bonding and structure. We use it to design drugs, mm. understand the structure of DNA. We use it to basically actually do all the tool craft we do in chemistry today. Um, and it's kind of the bedrock. So the reason why I'm going in such detail it's important for viewers to understand Perfect. there is not a new periodic table here you can use the chemistry. It mm. would be confusing, and none of the things we, we do would work. We train physicians, you know, drug discoverers, um, inorganic chemists, people do, doing green energy, people doing synthetic biology. They all use the same periodic table, and it works every day in the same way that Newtonian mechanics works. It may not be perfect, and the absolute truth, for everything, but it's really, really close. Hmm. So those things don't really exist. It's only one substance. Now the problem is, the first thing that we're able. To okay, just just a moment. Yeah, He's saying something doesn't exist. I wanna I wanna yeah, rewind yeah, a bit. That's and then explain. Between yeah. hydrogen, carbon, silicon, cobalt, rhodium, okay. they're all bonded. They're all sit be as the middle point between two noble gases. So those things don't really exist. It's only one substance. Now the problem is, the. F so that that's where I really kind of fell off my chair, because, <laughs> okay. um, you know, that's just uh, uh, that's just not true. So the de so an element is defined is defined by its number of um of uh, its atomic number, right? Because it the the entire thing is the the proton the number of protons and electrons. Now. A given, at a given atom, an element, can have different numbers of neutrons, and they're called isotopes. And in fact, I'll give a plug for Glasgow. The isotope was, in, was discovered by Frederick Soddy at the University of Glasgow, just a few miles from here, where he was like, oh, I'm going crazy. I've got these elements. I've got these, sorry, these um, elements. They have the same chemistry, but when I weigh them, they weigh differently. Right, What's right. going on? And then, and they realize that actually there's different numbers of neutrons, and then we put together the atomic theory. So no, carbon and hydrogen are not the same. If you, the only way you can turn hydrogen into carbon is in the sun when it, when it basically explodes. 
So the only way these can come one is if you were to literally rip apart all the protons and neutrons and get out the constituent quarks and gluons and make a quark gluon plasma at whatever million, hundreds of millions of degrees Kelvin. And so, so this. Terrence Howard reminds me a lot of Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was not an inventor. He was more of a visionary. So I think he has a lot of ideas, um, but then again, it has to be practical. You can't just throw out an idea and say, this, this does not work, like computing the exact same thing, right? If I were to come out today and say, I mean, they're wrong about the iPhones, they're wrong about cameras and all of that, right? We have a lot of scientific evidence through history, which proves that no Yambo, you are wrong because we have actually studied this, we've created cameras, what have you done? So I get it, I understand exactly what he means. It was just, you know, uh, you know, not correct. And I'm, I'm not sure why he was, what he's trying to say. Maybe my only thought is if he was doing in good faith, um, he's either number one mistaken, which that's oh. fair enough. We're mistaken about things all the time. Or number two, he's trying to convey some kind of acoustic poetry to say, oh, they're the one thing because they have these um, values equ equated with them. A bit like if I took a, a blue car and a blue Jeep and a blue bicycle, they are different things, but they are they are all blue. Yes. And maybe he was trying to say yes, something it, like that. that was my understanding. So the string theorist would say, well, hydrogen and helium and lithium, they may look different, but they're firstly all just some arrangement of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And then even further, there's some quarks and then electrons. So they're all just quarks and leptons. Even further, they're just strings, manifestations of different vibration vibrational modes of the strings. So... It was my understanding that what he's saying is that, that they're the same in a similar manner. Now, he's not saying this string theory is correct. In fact, I don't believe he was, he's referenced string theory. And by the way, for the people watching, I have a string theory iceberg, in case you're interested with about the math of string theory. It's a three-hour video. But that was my understanding. As for what is that unifying element or substance, I don't know what he was saying. I think he was saying it was all reflections of hydrogen or whatever hydrogen is maybe he calls it something else does that sound like what he could be <laughs> saying I, I i mean i think i think so i mean look is it, it a wonderful exposition and that i mean i saw online and there's like all the people going wow there's a new reality here and there's all the haters <laughs> going this is complete gibberish and i'm like well, he's not a he's not a chemist, right? And mm. he's not using chemistry to do stuff. Mm. And so I, you know, what an interesting non sequitur, <laughs> you know. I, but I, 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 the reason why I'm talking to you about this is I think a it's super interesting culturally, and mm. b no, 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 there is one periodic table and it works quite well, thanks. And and the same way, you know, you can say at one level description we're all strings if string theory is indeed correct, and that let's assume it could be like that's good. But then at another level description where we've got quarks and gluons they're all one thing but the fact is the difference between a hydrogen atom and a carbon atom is six protons versus one proton. yes yes that's amazing right to actually turn a hydrogen into a carbon you have to get at least maybe this guy should have been my chemist teacher he's very 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 good at explaining six of these charges together and you have to come up with some neutrons as well to boot to make sure you get your C12 because you want six protons and six neutrons and six electrons. And so that's really that's a really hard thing to do. And you can view that these elements are like crystallized matter at this energy level. So basically, if you have ultimate infinite energy in the universe, then everything's just basically, I don't know, whatever the the highest level energy description is it could be let's say a quark and gluon and then as you as you cool it down they crystallize into certain things and the crystallization is controlled by the way they interact mm -hmm. and then they collide and you produce hydrogen helium da, 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 da. and the thing that i love about all of this the periodic table and i would be remiss if i didn't mention it is like the, the elements in our body that help us help biology work i mean they were manufactured in in the star as it exploded uh, Whoa, that's and so that's kind of crazy. familiar like uh, you know don't give up on the element easily they're not the same thing something really absolutely incredible happened to produce us 
a star exploded. Whereas all the hydrogen in the universe, that hydrogen probably is produced in some other processes or can be traced back to the Big Bang. So those things don't really exist. It's only one substance. Now, the problem is the first thing that we're able to perceive is hydrogen. That's the first visible element because before it is too dense for us to perceive it. You understand what I'm okay. saying? Okay. Okay. I don't understand what he's saying. So I know I do. Okay. I have no clue what that is about. Oh, I could speculate. Please, guys, can you just get to the other things as well? Because if we're just sitting with I, with the periodic table, I think it's a waste of time. Yes, we've disproved that he's not a chemist. Let's move on. Um, but he's on a different plane of existence to me at this point. <laughs> okay, I thought at first he was referring to how directly after the Big Bang, you couldn't see photons even because they were too high energy. By the way, this has a technical term called recombination, which means that the universe was opaque because there were photons that were constantly scattering off free electrons. So in other words, the path of photons were extremely short and they couldn't travel without interacting with electrons. Uh, maybe, but that's kind of, it's kind of, yeah, okay. That's cool. Okay. So it seems to me like what's happened here, and th maybe I, I keep this and maybe I keep this out, but it seems like someone is is studying at the first or second year undergraduate conceptual level and then realizing that what was told in high school was incomplete, maybe even incorrect. Like F doesn't equal MA and M isn't just M, there's rest mass as well. And then rather than having the feeling like, whoa, this is cool, which tends to be the feeling that most physicists and mathematicians have in my experience, he has, Terence has taken it from this is cool to this is reflective of something covert and tendentious and I'm going to assume there's something suspicious going on. And, and part of that's correct, at least to me, the suspicious part, because one of the reasons why I started this podcast was because there are, there are three levels of explanation. There's level one, which is the high school pop pop-sci understanding, surface level, cosmetic level understanding. And then there's level two, where you understand now the rigor, the equations behind it. And then there's level three, where you're able to derive the equations based on the Popsi definition, because you have such familiarity with the equations. Public science communication is at level one. So you can think of Neil deGrasse Tyson is at level one. And there's also a level two. And so to me, you should be wary of level one, or you should know where the person is who's giving you the information. You're obviously at level three, Lee. Okay, so... <laughs> Right. Don't attack Neil like that. Neil is a very, very smart guy. He's the guy which they've sent out. Okay, so we have to go with Neil because we are all at level one. We <laughs> imagine if Neil is at level one. Imagine the ones which are like level three. They're like, Ugh. Yeah, what is Yambo even talking about? About space elevators. What is this guy talking about? Professor Cronin is obviously at level three. And so you should just know where is the level that you're getting the information from and what level are you speaking to? Because <laughs> the surface level simplistic ones can be misleading. There's nothing wrong with what he is doing from a curiosity point of view. Mm. But what I think, what is interesting, if there is a confusion here, or if, if it's not allegorical and it's just confused, what he's done is picked different levels and mixed them up. And he's trying to synthesize something else. And he maybe hasn't had time or he hasn't had confidence. And I completely understand that. Interdisciplinary science, we do that all the time. That's why, you know, you can make fun of what he's saying here. And indeed, I'm sure some chemists do. But just imagine how difficult it is for someone who understands cell biology and string theory to try and talk to one another. And they can, when they've only got a level one of understanding of each other's mm. respective disciplines and try to dig deeper where there's a new thing that has to happen. And that's why I'm very sympathetic but yeah, it's true, actually. There's a saying that the more you learn, the less you know. And that is 100% true because something which I've realized with even creating content, the more and more I've delved deep into it, the more I understand that I, I'm not that good when it comes to content creation. I mean, I'm good. I'm maybe, what, level one. But then there's, I'd have to say, what, the DJ academics, the... Joe Buttons, they're at a level five. Do is remove the conspiracy nature because for high school, it's just expediency, right? You know, my son is 16. 
he's doing his high school chemistry exam and he's making fun of me because I said, you don't have to define what's an element and he can't define it. He said, but it's not in my curricula. Mm -hmm. They don't ask for that, Dad. Yes. You know, you know, and, and, and he, he's not wrong, right? They don't ask for that precise thing. And so I think there is this kind of, you know, this kind of uh, conspiracy-esque thing and then this confusion and then this frustration. And actually, he has the makings of a great scientist. Great scientists have to contain co the frustration for being not understanding, the conspiracy that maybe they're not quite knowing what's going on with reality because reality is not giving them what they want to know, and then basically his wish to interrogate and get the information and then synthesize it over time. And it's just sometimes if, you know, I'm quite gullible as a scientist, and then suddenly I'm up to like, oh, no, of course that doesn't work. I need to do that control. Wait, what do you oh, mean you're was gullible a beautiful as a scientist? Idea. Well, like I remember a few years ago, I was making magnets and I thought I, I, what I, desi I designed by, well, I discovered with my team a magnet that was really hard, but it was based on carbon. And I was like, wow, I've got this magnet. It's really hard. It acts like iron, but there's no iron. It's really hard. And I was like, oh my God, this is, this is great because it means we can use carbon, like, which is really cheap and make really hard magnets and not have to mine stuff like, you know, all these mm -hmm. rare earths and, and all this. And I was doing all the experiments. So I was starting to write the paper. And then I was like, to, said to my team, there's something wrong here. And we then we took the stuff and burnt it in a certain way. And we burnt all the carbon away. So the so magnetism should have gone away. But still there were magnetic flakes. And I realized what had happened is I was using a nickel spatula. And the, oh. and the atoms of nickel were falling off the spatula and going into my carbon they were just gluing onto it and nickel was really magnetic under some circumstances and it was faking out my car and i was like you know and i was like oh i'm so gullible there's no electrons there there's no magnetism it was a nickel contamination damn i see i see and so so sometimes mixing this kind of curiosity kind of and and it, you know this childlike wow what has happened here is a great recipe for doing science, but you then need to have the the razor of reason, if you like, the rigor. kind of, you know. It so my question then becomes, do you guys think, and leave it in the comment section, do you guys think that there is a conspiracy of higher elites, which gives us just a level one understanding of everything, where they almost say like, okay, they're just, this is enough for them to understand a little bit of it. But then we're at a level seven or a level three compared to them. Do you think that could be a plausible theory? Or do you guys think that there's no real conspiracy? There's maybe just scientists trying to figure out things as they go along. And, you know, everyone is just winging it because I've thought of that as well. Exactly. Calculations. So, so I said so I said on Twitter, uh, I was somewhat joking, but somewhat serious that there's this phrase called shut up and calculate. And I said, understand and speak up is greater than shut up and calculate. Like just great. 100%. 100%. However, what I didn't say, which is underneath that implicit, hopefully, mm -hmm. is that in order to get to the point where you understand and can speak up, you do need to go through a period of calculating. Mm -hmm. So you need to have precision with your fingers and pen and work with a concept or an equation or co with coding and otherwise you just get a misunderstanding times another misunderstanding mm -hmm. which unfortunately does not equal understanding despite yeah. one times one equaling one so so i'll give you a subtlety a subtle case so the one times one equals one he says the reason why that's not true is that it's not true that if you have one dollar times one dollar you get one dollar and he's correct one dollar times one dollar doesn't equal one dollar However, oh my God, that's crazy. So one, 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 let's continue listening. But then again, Terrence, you got a point. Tennis match. Okay. Bam. Scientific community is like, bam, bam. And then Terrence is like, no, 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 I got you. I got you. Like, sisa, you know, I don't know. I don't play tennis, but. I imagine that's how it is like. Okay, let me say it like this. $5 times $1 does not equal $5. But 5 times $1 equals $5. And so to people who 
are just listening in their car and they're driving, they're like, but that sounds the same. What do you mean? Well, think about it like this. If you have two apples and then someone gives you, and someone multiplies your apples by three, then you have six apples. Okay. Mm -hmm. But if you have two apples and someone multiplies your apples by three apples, you're just, you have WTF amount of apples. Like it doesn't make sense. You have apples squared. It's a different unit. So $1 times $1 doesn't equal $2. It equals some amalgam, some, something like $1 squared. One, by the way, dollar squared is in the brackets. Hmm. But you can still have one times one equals one because it's unitless. By the way, I have this whole two-hour video on <laughs> natural units, which goes over the undergraduate education and theoretical <laughs> physics in approximately two hours from a natural units perspective. And all you need is high school math. Um, that's absolutely right. That's a really nice way of putting it because there's this, this whole idea that mathematics, lab the labeling schemes that go with mathematics, when you're trying to get to abstraction, you start with physical example, your one dollar right, times right, one dollar exactly. or one apple, and then you abstract out, and that abstraction said, right, can I now apply my counting to I don't know to pounds, uh, to tomatoes, and so on, and then as you go down and go up, it's like the process of abstraction is a way of building these mental architectures and then removing the units in such a way that you can then understand architecturally where you add them on, and there are so many things that we do that we we build these architectures on. If you think about the concept of of debt or interest rate, right? And 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 it, I think actually the the concept of our economics is more proof that time is fundamental. But that's for another podcast, right. another day. Because you're 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 betting on the possibility space of new things you can build, right? You know, the whole concept of of um of capitalism is to basically take capital, put it into technology, and build new things, and the value of the stuff goes up. That's why the value of our economy goes up. But this okay, let me try to understand it. One times one equals one because you're starting off with not a lot. I guess that's what they're trying to say. But the more you have, the more you get. Is that what they're trying to say? So that would make a lot of sense if they explain it that way, right? Let's say you are trying to pull a car, right? From the beginning, when you pull a car, because I don't know, how much does a car weigh? A ton, right? When you're starting off, right, the car is heaviest because you have to use so much energy to pull that car from that position to movement, right? But once it starts moving and once you start getting more and more energy, then it becomes easier and easier. Maybe that's how they should explain it. It's a big digression from here, but it's just a nice thing that fits into the one time with one argument. Um, and I'm, you know, when I saw that, I was just like, no, dude, we need to do some category theory. I was like, no, no, we're not going to do that. It's like, it's just a simple misconception that's easily, easily adjusted. However, I don't know if he was, I don't know what I would mean. Like, I, I'm one of my best attributes is like i'm wrong all the time right so it's just like someone pointing out to you like, you're wrong because of this and you're like oh actually that's right i think people might have tried to point out to them this one times one thing and he's like no hmm. and, and then and then what happens is you build in this kind of this kind of resilience as like this resistance to oh. the new paradigm and again you see this in science you see this in science and like the real scientists if you like or the other playful ones that make mistakes and correct. That's really cool. Whereas, and that's how science kind of works. So science kind of has playful ones and occasionally they make mistakes. And then there are the people like, no, this is how it is, it's not moving. And it plays together quite nicely where you have stubbornness and playfulness. Right. And, and, and they interact in such a way that if you're respectful of one another, you can, you can basically discover new things and also stop people discovering nonsense and say, no, that's not correct. Yes. Because you do critical thinking and so on. But maybe that's a bit of a digression. Well, I don't know. Well, no, it, it's, it's a great point. So Nima, Nima Arkani Hamed, the physicist said that what, ca what characterizes physics or physicists, sorry, is radical conservatism. So not conservatism, not radicalness, but both. And the reason is that Einstein, while we look back fondly and romanticize and say, okay, what he did was undo what came prior to him, that's not true. He overturned one axiom, but held the rest so fixed. Let's see. Let's just get, get through the rest of this. Oh, and just a quick aside again. Look, if you're going to redefine one times one to equal, say, two, 
the multiplication has something called a group structure. So you can't mm -hmm. just change one part of a group structure without changing other parts of the group structure. And one way for people to understand this is you have a multiplication to end. It's called multiplication, but it's technically a group operation. And you can have a multiplication table if you have a finite group. And it's something like a, a crossword puzzle or a Sudoku. So if you were to change just one word in the Sudoku from screen to rabbit, you can't do so without changing the other a local structure, maybe even global structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But That's a good way of putting it. I like it. <laughs> As you reach into the next octave, the carbon octave, and they call that the a bisexual tone because the carbon has two tones to it. It has a negative side and a positive side. The part Okay, just a moment. And I don't mean this to be a racy comment or, or like I'm making fun of, of either you or, or him or uh, I, I, just, I just don't know. Is bisexual tone something that chemists call chemicals? Like how they're spin. No, I mean, I wonder if he's talking about being amphoteric or the fact that carbon can be positively charged and negatively charged. I just have no clue what he was going on about. I mean, it's just like, I was like... Yeah, I think it's the second which he mentioned there. Uh, for me, I was completely... I mean, I was pretty bemused. And then when he got to this, I was just like, I was just... Uh, um, what was your, the problem what was is your initial just, reaction? Be honest. My initial... My initial reaction sure. that he was he was on a different plane of existence is sounded <laughs> really fun, and um, but it wasn't my plane of existence uh, or anyone else's. I see. And so Terry again, like I, I've tried to reach out to to Terry over email, and I haven't been successful. But he's invited to this podcast, so you're you're welcome to come on, Terry. Like I don't want to speak of you without you being here. We're only doing so because I I wasn't able to get a hold of you, and this is the closest I can get. And hopefully we can elucidate understanding for ourselves and and others at the same where time. Lithium behaves. Lithium is a is contractive. Beryllium is contractive. Boron is contractive. But the moment you get to carbon, you balance it out. It gets to a perfect balance of plus and minus four. So it's a double tone. Then, <laughs> okay. So, chemically speaking, what is what do you believe he's referring to here? What, what um, is this contraction? So, he might be talking to electronegativity, right, and say that metals are losing electrons, and but I have no idea. Okay. I mean, like, okay, he's so out with the birdies at this point. I'm just like, it's beautiful. It's it's it sounds beautiful, but it's nonsense. Okay, okay, that's more than <laughs> enough. Thank you, Professor. Where can people find out more about you, and what are you working on? Wow. Uh, you can find oh. me You find me on crononlab.com. And what am I working on right now? I'm trying to make life in the lab because that might help us find aliens. I'm trying to work on this, uh, this, pr this new theory for selection, um, assembly theory, which is causing people to get excited about looking at selection before evolution. And I'm also trying to work out how to make chemical computers and see if one day we can create chemical artificial chemical consciousness but that's the most controversial thing i can come up with with a juxtaposition of listening to this but that's maybe a podcast in the future if i get anywhere because i'm probably gonna fail all right thank you sir <laughs> you take care okay uh so my thoughts when it comes to this uh very very good episode i have to give it to both of them uh, they tried really to understand Terence. It's great that he just had a chemist on, so the chemist could really explain to us certain things, right? He did not go into depth because you can't. Chemistry is... I don't understand it. I don't want to understand chemistry, but I thought he was very, very good at explaining. This does not change so much when it comes to what I believe Terence is trying to do. What Terence is so good at is taking a lot of what a lot of people have done and trying to explain it into a very easy and a digestible piece so you, you understand all of it. So let's see what Russell Brand thinks. You know what's one of the other obvious benefits of the emergence of this space is well-educated people having brilliant and interesting conversations. Mm, the conversation agree. between Joe Rogan and Terence Howard is pretty surprising, isn't it? Because conversations like that remind us that now everyone's pretty well informed when it comes to 
For example, spike proteins or mm. cellular formation or the impact of gene therapies. Look at this conversation between a stand-up comedian podcaster and an actor and note how implausible that would have been 10 years ago. And it's because, in fact, as is acknowledged in the clip of the conversations that Joe Rogan started or at least amplified and that we continue to participate in. What you recognize when a conversation like this takes place is that without the censorship industrial complex, oh. without the ongoing legitimization of controlling what sort of information you get access to, centralized power cannot be victorious. Because when you have actors and comedians casually chatting about the dangers of gene therapy and spike protein, which you know the WHO treaty is designed to prevent going forward, you recognize that what we have in our hands now is seismic. We have the technology and the ability to create new localized democracies to challenge for the first time the great minotaurs, the great monoliths of centralized power. And it's all come in that most extraordinary form, the podcast, in this case, in the conversation between Joe Rogan and Terence Howard. Just notice how... Ex if I was running the world and I wanted to control the population, what I would have done is never create a social media. Feels like right now, in a sense, they opened Pandora's box and they're trying to close it, but it's just spreading more and more, right? And I'm like, from a power perspective, why even do it? Extraordinarily high the standard of conversation is and the amount of information and standard of information that's being conveyed and exchanged here is astonishing. They listen to everything I say. They do. I'm sure. They do. You, you took a lot a, of boring shit. You took a bold stand, though, years ago when the governments were trying to poison mm. their citizens. You took a very bold stand that nobody else took. That's what I was like, wow, I appreciate you because I lost three, four jobs because I refused to take it. I refuse. I bet you feel better about it now. I'm, well, especially when you know all these people that have health problems because of it. Cancers has increased three hundred percent. All cause more. I can say one hundred percent. I agree here, too, to Terence because I took it and I have heart complications. And there was a while there where I, I probably wasn't going to make it. So I'm very grateful that I'm young still healthy and could recover from it. But it's the scariest thing, trusting the government and finding out that they're trying to poison you. So I can take it from my personal experience that that happened to me and it was, it was terrifying. And I feel like I want to sue somebody, but then again, there are so many people which are like me, which have gone through the exact same thing. But that's just how it is, I guess. Mortality up 40% in some age groups. Pulmonary embolisms almost up like 500%. Yeah, Thrombosis. I wonder what caused that. Well, Crazy. the spike proteins that's being built and collected within the, in the system. Pulmonary aneurysms are up 25%. All cause mortality. It's unbelievable, isn't it? To hear those kind of statistics being exchanged in a mm. casual conversation that's likely being viewed by about 20 million people. When you look at the kind of content that the legacy media is putting out, whether it's through late night chat shows or news media, this is another world. The world we live in truly is another world. This is why that world is being maligned, because it's pretty clear that neither of these men are bad actors on a global st Yes, but we also have to acknowledge the fact that we are on their platforms. We can't really come away from that, right? And that's why I'm, I'm proposing. I'm not the guy which can code something like this because it's a website like this would take too much time. But then again, I do think that we should move over more into a decentralized platform, something like Bitcoin, but for information, videos, all of that, that should be free on the website. And I don't think that, I don't even think that there should be some form of like, advertisement on the website i think it should just be like a genuine website where the whole world can just post their videos they can have 
whatever crazy thoughts that they want to have. Of course, we have to have certain laws. Maybe, for instance, like nothing that harms other people. But then again, everything goes. Nothing that physically harms other people or calling to action to try to harm other people. That is totally forbidden on this platform. But everything goes. That's how I believe we can move forward because censoring some people doesn't work. Wow, wow, wow. And that is where I'm going to end the video. But this is an example of Terence being correct. This is his propulsion system and exactly what he's talking about, that instead of having a plane just flying straight forward, you'd want to have a plane being able to move around. Like I can fly up. I can fly sideways. I can fly backwards. This is very interesting. This is just a model right now. But uh, yeah, that is it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Like, comment, and share if you like videos like this. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.